Lindsay to Kirsten, we should have done the, the playlist from the summer. <laughs> oh, yeah. we, could, we, have, we normally have music, <laughs> which is fun. Yeah, we could explain what that is. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, lovely to see you this morning. And um, my name is Lindsay Wright. I'm the director of the Los Angeles Review of Books Publishing Workshop. Um, and I'm really happy to tell you about our program and the application process. Um, I'm joined here today by my wonderful colleague, Irene Yoon, who is the executive director of the Los Angeles Review of Books. Um, prior to um, becoming executive director, Irene was a faculty member at the um, publishing workshop and also its director. Um, and now she runs the entire ship of LARB, keeping us afloat. <laughs> <laughs> um, also joined um, by our, our um, intern, Myra Lopez, who is going to be um, moderating questions for us, um, as well as three of our alumni from the 2022 workshop, who I will introduce a little bit later um, in the program. Um, so our agenda today is um, we're going to talk about the mission and history of the workshop, go over the curriculum, who our speakers are, um, talk a little bit about the application process. Um, then I'm going to ask our alumni to speak about what the experience was like for them last year, and we will open up um, for questions um, at the very end. Um, so with that, um, I would love to um, ask Irene to speak a little bit about the history of the workshop since she has been involved almost since the very beginning. And perhaps Irene, you could tell us, um, for people who are not familiar, with LARB, um, what the Los Angeles Review of Books is as well. Oh, good, good call. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. Um, for those of you on the West Coast, it's you know, kind of an early start to the Friday morning. So thank you. And for those of you joining us from elsewhere, really happy to have you all here. Um, yeah, so a little bit about the Los Angeles Review of Books for those of you who aren't as familiar um, with the organization kind of writ large. So LARB is a literary arts nonprofit. We um, have two kind of big flagship um, editorial projects, um, the main one really being our, our website. So that might be the way that most people know us and interact with us. Um, we have a website that publishes book reviews, interviews, essays, um, podcasts um, for free uh, to the public daily. Um, so we have um, a ton of content that's been going back for 12 years now. We've been around for, um, for a dozen years. We're like a preteen. <laughs> an organization which has been um which has been a lot of fun um and um in addition to having that, our online magazine where we host um all that content and um and our podcasts and whatnot we also do have a print magazine a print quarterly literary magazine where we publish original fiction poetry essays art um uh, on a given theme um each quarter um we also do a lot of public programs so um the the publishing workshop is our kind of main educational program that we're really proud of and I feel like speaks very much to the heart of our organization um, organization mission writ large but um but we also do do um events readings um you see a little sign here for lit lit which is our little literary fair which we started actually as an outgrowth of the publishing workshop to really feature and showcase the work of local literary arts organizations and publishers here on the west coast um kind of a counterpoint to the largest literary you know the book festival the lat fob festival that also takes place here in la where our little <laughs> the little one that we're very proud of um and um, we also have a membership program. And so, you know, because we are a literary arts nonprofit, we are supported by our readers um, and the community. And so we're really grateful for that and for that um, support to have sustained us for the last dozen years and hopefully into the future. Um, so, you know, as we've grown and developed, we started off as a, as a Tumblr page, basically. We started off as a Tumblr that was, you know, in our founder's basement <laughs> um, and then grew into this website added on the print journal, added on our podcast and radio show, added on all these public programs. Um, and as part of that, the publishing workshop came into existence um, really as an, as an idea and as a, as a goal and as a project in 2016. Um, I think it was a moment um, in the publishing industry where there's a lot of, I think, self-reflection, um, maybe a little bit belatedly. <laughs> Um, about the kind of um, the compositional you know, makeup of the publishing workforce and the kinds of implications that that has for what we you know, um, put out there in the world, what readers can engage with. Um, Leon Lowe, a children's book um, publisher based in New York City, um, released their diversity baseline survey um, where they took a, you know, a very expansive survey of everyone working at 
various levels of publishing in book publishing and magazine publishing to just get a sense of where people were coming from. Um, and what they found was maybe not surprising, but disappointing <laughs> in, the, in the kind of homogeneity of, um, of representation um, within the publishing workforce. And so um, that was kind of the context in which the publishing workshop on our end came into existence, really thinking about ways in which we could actually try and create new avenues of access for people who maybe can't afford to live in New York on an unpaid internship or don't have those kinds of legacy connections to um, publishing houses from you know, their institutions or from family or friends, et cetera. Um, like how could we actually create a training program where we could provide some of that exposure to all the different kinds of really exciting work that happens in publishing. Um, and also, um, you know, the creation of networks where you can actually connect to some of these people without having that kind of pre-existing um, um, in other contexts. And how can we make that more affordable? Um, because I think one of the big things that we really realized was that there is a very high financial bar of entry for people who are interested in getting involved in publishing. And just, you know, for us here at LARB, um, being very committed to free content. <laughs> Um, and to really kind of trying to expand the literary conversation and bring as many people in um, with as few barriers as possible, that was a really important um, uh, part of, of imagining this educational program back in 2016. So we had our first program in 2017, and we partnered with USC, so we were actually an in-person program way back when, <laughs> for the first three years, um, and we had planned on continuing on as an in-person program, um, but then 2020 happened <laughs> in all of its glory. And so um, we ended up switching to an online program, which was actually really exciting for us too, because we realized that insofar as accessibility has been a real um, priority for us um, uh, mission-wise, being online actually allowed us to be able to bring in more speakers, to bring in um, more students from around the world, to be able to accommodate differences in schedules and things like that. So that's been actually really exciting to see how that's all gone. Um, the other thing I'll say, I guess, you know, um, in terms of the history and the mission of, of our program, and we wanted to really um, do what we could to be able to bring in and train a pool of students and fellows um, who are coming from a wide range of backgrounds that, again, aren't necessarily represented um, uh, in publishing. But we also wanted to represent the kind of work that's happening outside of the, the big five. I mean, we definitely have speakers coming from the big five main, you know, New York publishers, but we also really wanted to highlight and showcase the fact that there's some really exciting publishing happening in smaller houses and presses um, and organizations across the country. Um, and so we have quite a few um, representatives from independent presses, um, smaller magazines, um, literary arts nonprofits that are doing a lot of this work to really kind of help kind of keep this community going and producing and making some really exciting content happen. So um, that's, I guess, the second strand of the kind of, you know, um, I think the unique thing that I feel like our, our program does offer, which I'm really proud of. And the third, I guess, is something that um, uh, was very personal to me. <laughs> um, insofar as I was coming to LARP from an academic background. Um, and so um, I, I had done my PhD in English at UC Berkeley. I was, you know, thinking I would be, you know, in, in that kind of academic world for the long term, but in kind of moving into a more public facing space was really excited to see that this was an opportunity that we can make available for other students who are kind of, you know, passionate about literature, or excited about literary criticism, about literary production, about, you know, this world of letters and writing, um, and to make that possible as well through partnerships with universities and colleges. Um, around the country. So that's a little bit about, I think, you know, um, what sets our program apart and where we're coming from, the history of where we where we started um, and where we want to see, you know, the publishing industry go, I think, thanks to the really wonderful fellows that we've had a chance to work with, some of whom you'll hear from today. Um, yeah, I don't know, Lindsay, is there anything else I should add before <laughs> turning it over to you? <laughs> no, I think that's great. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, and I'll say Irene is very much involved in the, um, the publishing workshop. So if you join us this summer, you will be seeing her um, as well as me. Um, and so um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, our curriculum um, and the application process. So Irene, would you mind bringing up our slides? Um, so the publishing workshop will be between June 20th and July 21st. Um, we will be taking the 3rd and 4th of July off um, for the holiday. Um, but it is a um, Monday through Friday program. 
Um, and it's a very intensive program. Um, so we tried to represent um, the wide variety of different organizations and presses and magazines um, throughout the United States. Um, so you will, as Arian said, be hearing from people in the big five. So the big five are the major publishers in New York City, um, and they are really conglomerations. Um, so publishing has been conglomerating. It's a big uh, topic that we'll be discussing. Um, so these companies like Penguin Random House have um, purchased smaller presses. Um, so we'll be hearing from um, some people from the corporate offices of Penguin Random House and Macmillan, um, but also from some, some of the smaller imprints. Um, so for example, uh, One World, um, which is an imprint that um, specializes in underrepresented voices, um, Knopf and uh, Ferris, Strauss and Giroux, which are both um, really literary imprints of the larger um, company. Um, and now we have two alumni at FSG, which is very exciting. Um, we'll also be highlighting independent presses, um, which is really where our heart is um, at the Los Angeles Review of Books. Um, so some of these presses will be from New York. Um, for example, uh, Europa Editions is a New York-based um, publisher that um, specializes in literature and translation um, and international literature. But we also want to show um, uh, houses ac across the country. So um, Gray House Press um, and Milkweed Editions are both um, based out of um, Minnesota. Um, then we'll be hearing from academic publishers, um, Princeton University Press, the director will be talking to us about the mission of academic publishing. Um, we have very exciting, one of our alumni is now an associate editor at Stanford University Press. And so for the first time, um, we're having inviting one of our alumni to be one of our uh, keynote guest speakers. And she'll be talking about um, what it's like on the day-to-day -day basis to be an academic editor. Um, we'll hear from uh, the person who is in charge of international rights at the University of Texas Press. It's a very interesting um, subspecialty. Of, uh, of publishing. Um, and then we'll have, that's the first two weeks or two to two to two and a half weeks. Um, then we'll switch over to magazines um, and we'll hear from a wide variety of different types of magazines. So the Paris Review, uh, which is a nonprofit magazine, literary magazine, the Georgia Review, which is based out of the University of Georgia. Um, and then more popular, um, you know, cultural magazines like Yes Magazine, um, Yvette Dion, who is a writer and now the editor in chief at um, Yes Magazine will be coming. Um, and um, then after those two weeks, um, we switch over to what we call new media and also literary nonprofits. Um, so new media, we'll be hearing from people who are in podcasting, um, literary scouts who are um, in charge of acquiring um, books for adaptation for um, uh, production companies, um, both movie and TV, um, and also audiobook production, which has become um, a huge part of the, the industry. Um, and then mission-driven literary nonprofits like the Penn Faulkner uh, Foundation, which has um, an award and a lot of um, educational programming and the Asian American Writers Workshop are two examples of those. Um, and within all of these categories, we also like to um, invite people who are in different roles at the organization. Um, so of course, editors, um, but also people who work in marketing, in publicity um, and more of the administrative side, um, in production, um, in art production, um, because we found that sometimes people come into the workshop with um, one idea of, of what they might be interested in career-wise in publishing. So for example, um, they really want to learn about be becoming an editor, but then as they listen to people talk about different roles, they might discover that, well, actually I really identify with um, the people who work in publicity. And it would be really interesting to work on creative partnerships and, and projects to um, publicize a magazine or a press. Um, so that is our, that, those are our speakers. And these are just a few examples because we do have uh, I think over 50 organizations that will be joining us this summer. Okay. So this is um, our schedule. So we do meet Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time to about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and um, the schedule is always pretty much the same in the morning. So we begin at 9 a.m. and we have a 90 minute talk with um, question and answer period at the end for discussion um, with a speaker. So on this day, um, Christy Henry, who's the director of um, Princeton University Press, will be speaking about um, the mission of the press. 
Um, we'll take a short break so everyone can stretch and get that cup of coffee. Um, and we'll come back with Carolyn, who will talk about um, the editorial work of academic um, publishing. Um, then we have lunch, or depending on where you are, maybe dinner or high tea. Um, and during that hour, uh, you can sign up in advance to meet with some of our speakers in a 10 minute conversation. And the purpose of this is to ask questions, of course, um, but also to form that personal connection um, with the speakers that you could potentially follow up on later um, through email. Um, some of our fellows have managed to go get a cup of coffee, depending on where they are and, and who the speaker is and how busy they are. Um, and also, um, if that organization later has an internship opportunity or a job, um, you can um, mention that you had this conversation with um, someone who works there in your cover letter, and that can be um, a good way to get that interview um, for the position. Um, in the afternoon, three days a week, um, we will have the practical tracks. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, or um, two days a week, we will have some professional development workshops. Um, so if you are about to go on the job market and you would like to work on your resume or take your academic CV and turn it into a resume, um, we'll have a workshop with that where you can get some feedback. Um, also working on cover letters and other materials um, for your job search. Um, those are optional, it depends on um, your interest in those. Um, so the, all of the lectures are um, recorded. Um, we do encourage people if they can to participate in person because it's really the best way to get the full experience and to participate in the discussion um, and to get to know the other fellows. Um, throughout we have a Slack channel where people can talk and exchange information and um, uh, get to know each other. Um, but if you, you know, you have a job, you have family responsibilities, you need to miss a day or a lecture, we do record it and you can view those recordings um, at your own pace. Um, okay, so on to the next. Okay, so the practical tracks. Um, so everyone in the program will be able to choose between two different tracks that meet three times a week. Um, and these are um, an opportunity to develop some um, skills um, related to publishing and a little bit more knowledge about um, how presses and magazines operate. Um, so for the book track, um, we will be um, meeting with Daniel Lisi, who is an independent publisher based out of Los Angeles. Um, and he runs an organization called Chapter House, which is a group of small presses. Um, he will be talking about the question of how does a book get from the publisher and into the bookstore, or into the library. So it will be issues of um, distribution and production, and we'll do things like um, take a, a book and um, create the ISBN. Um, we'll also be hearing from um, booksellers and um, other people who work in distribution um, and manage the, um, that side of, of the business. Um, and in this part, um, you'll be working in a small group of about 10 people on a manuscript throughout the, the five-week process. Uh, people in the magazine track will actually be creating and publishing um, a literary magazine. Um, so um, the PubLab is an online channel of the Los Angeles Review of Books, and it publishes original writing and also art by the fellows of the program and also uh, alumni of the program. Um, and it's a really beautiful project. We're very proud of it. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to um, publish your work. Um, some, I think some of our fellows, it was their first um, real public facing um, opportunity to, to share, share their work outside of university. Um, and for the public um, lab, you will choose between different roles in a magazine. Um, so we'll have some people will work on developmental editing, some people work on copy editing, some people will um, do the um, online production, some people will be art producers, and some people will do the marketing on social media. And you'll be meeting with um, staff members of the Los Angeles Review of Books who will mentor you through that process and produce this um, amazing literary magazine at the end, which is a very fast process for in five weeks to, um, to do it. So we're very proud that, um, that uh, our fellows have done such a beautiful job. Okay, so a little bit about the application process. So um, the applications are due March 31st. Um, you can find our application on our website. It's through Submittable. Um, it's a pretty simple um, streamlined application. There's a brief form to fill out. Um, we ask for your resume or CV. 
And the most important part is really the personal statement. Um, so the personal statement, we just ask you why you want to attend um, the publishing workshop. What do you hope to achieve? What are you passionate about um, in publishing? And um, how do you think this um, uh, might help you achieve those goals? Um, if you have experience in publishing, you can submit some work samples. It's not a requirement. Um, some people come into the publishing workshop with no experience in publishing, or maybe they've been involved in a campus literary magazine. Other people have um, been working in publishing for a few years, um, and they might already have some, some work that they can share. Um, we do provide um, some financial aid. Um, it's a really important part of our mission. Um, we have scholarship partners um, who are different universities and departments within universities. Um, and if you have any questions about that, feel, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and um, we also provide some financial aid um, that is directly through LARB that we um, raise through grants and also donations from some of our supporters. So um, if you are not able to afford the tuition, which is $3,000, um, you can submit a statement explaining what your financial situation is. Um, and we also ask for a proof of income. So the 1040, um, you can also fill out a FAFSA, which is free online. Um, if you are an international um, applicant, um, you can submit um, whatever the international equivalent is um, for your country, but please explain it in your statement of needs so we don't have to try to interpret, um, you know, a, a German or Indian tax return. Um, great. So again, the applications are due March 31st, and we look forward to um, learning about you. Um, so now I would love to um, introduce some of our alumni who have been gracious enough to join us today. And they're going to talk a little bit about their experience. So I'm going to start. Um, Desi Alleman is a copywriter and graphic designer who's based in Los Angeles. He has a BA from the University of California at Los Angeles, where he majored in American literature and culture and comparative literature. He has written and collaborated on several short films, both amateur and professional, and is currently writing several episodes of a web series to be filmed later this fall. Um, he's also helping us out um, at LARB with design. So if you've seen some of our social media, um, Desi might have had a hand in creating that. Uh, Natalia Afonso is a translator, teacher, researcher, and activist who sometimes commits to poems. She's from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where she created and hosted an award-winning literary salon and organized the publication of booklets that memorialized each event. She has an MA in Literatures of English Language from the University of Rio de Janeiro, and she's currently a PhD candidate at the University of California at Irvine, where she studies Caribbean and Brazilian literature. Um, she's also currently an editorial intern at Grey Wolf Press, and she just published her first um, translation chapbook, which I happen to have right here, and it's very lovely from um, Ugly Duckling Press. Okay, and um, Livia Lima is a book and art enthusiast with a PhD in Brazilian modern cinema and literature from the University of Sao Paulo. With two of 10 plus years of experience in publishing, she was an editorial coordinator, assistant editor, and editorial production manager at several Brazilian presses and periodicals. She was born in Rio de Janeiro and has lived in Sao Paulo for the past decade and is currently based in Seattle, Washington, where she's part of the curatorial team for Travesias Brazilian Film Festival at Northwest Film Forum. So I'm really happy that these um, three alumni from the 2022 program are here with us today. Um, and I'm going to ask them just to tell us a little bit about why they applied for the um, publishing workshop and also um, what did you get out of the experience? What was the experience like for you? Do we start with that? Maybe we can start in the order I introduced you. So maybe Desi, Natalia, and then Livia. Sure. <clears throat> can you hear me all right? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Desi. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, um, uh, Lindsay. And thank you, Irene, for hosting this event. Um, where to begin? Uh, let's say um, how I got introduced to the workshop. I knew very little of LARB, almost nothing before I attended the workshop. So if you know what LARB is, you're already ahead of me by like several steps. And um, I originally pursued a career in graphic design and as well as um, writing, ghostwriting and doing some script work. And then of course the pandemic happened, which um, really made me reevaluate and look differently, I guess, at what I was seeking from a career. And I wanted to publish books but I had no idea how to do that. So 
all I knew from publishing was that you submitted a manuscript and then it ended up on a bookshelf. For the workshop and how the information knowledge I got, I'm still trying to distill what <laughs> all the breadth of knowledge that I got just because I had no idea how much effort went into a book and how much like a team produces books from legal all the way to artwork all the way to distribution I know so much more now it's like a little overwhelming but even then it's something I don't know I think it's something that I still am truly in love with as someone that didn't loves literature but wasn't part of that world the what I learned from the workshop was invaluable to me and LARP still can't get rid of me I hope that answers the question <laughs> Thank you, Desi. Oh, and I'll add, Desi is an amazing baker. We see brought us some great cookies to, at Christmas time. Natalia? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Natalia Fonsu, and Lindsay read you my bio. Um, I'm actually not a PhD candidate yet. I'm still before that stage, and I don't know what I'm going to do, but... Um, so if you are, okay, so let me rewind. Um, so I moved to the United States for a number of reasons, including to pursue a PhD. I had got an MA in Brazil like a couple of years before. Um, academic life in Brazil can be a little different than um, in the US. Um, and I had been uh, an English teacher and academic consultant in Brazil for more than 10 years. I also dabbled in some literary stuff. I have a lot of friends who are writers. I was better, um, a better reader for um, a number of them. Um, I was translating as I was pursuing an academic um, career. So I had some con, I had self-published something. So I had like tangentially been in publishing without officially being publishing in Brazil, if that makes sense. Um, and then, I moved to the US, I started the PhD program in 2020 and everything was virtual. And um, if you don't know many people and just like the PhD program is kind of like your social, not I, I can't even use that word, like the people you know and you are in contact with. And um, I was, going through my emails and UCI announced, University of California Irvine announced that this thing called LARB existed. So like that is the, <laughs> I had never heard of LARB um, and that they were offering um, fellowships, scholarships and fellowships for people to attend um, over the summer. And I was like, wow, they seem to be covering a lot of the things that I'm interested in, but I thought would never be an option for me because I am not from here, I had always heard that publishing was about networking and knowing people and people who go to college together and decide to create a magazine. And one of their parents has a lot of money to put behind this magazine, you know? <laughs> These were the stories I had heard um, about publishing. So I decided to take a chance. Um, I applied, I got in and it was, an amazing experience, very intense. Um, I highly recommend, but also as Lindsay said, if you can try to organize your life to attend as many of the lectures online, but also have your own like self-care schedule, you know, to get up, stretch, keep drinking water, all of those important things that we always forget uh, to be able to make it through the month. Um, I would also say that, um, if I may, the three of us represent a portion of the workshop, but there are also people who either haven't gone to college, like had dropped out of college or weren't in college anymore, people who are working in the third sector, like um, as waitresses, waiters, you know, so, and some people like Livia who had a PhD and weren't, you know, so there were people in different stages um, of life. And I, I personally didn't feel uh, alienated or, you know, like that people were looking down on me, but also I gravitated towards different groups of people. That was the other thing for me. 
Uh, a number of us were translators, so we connected in that sense. A number of us were interested in this kind of literature. Um, there was a little group of Brazilian people. So, you know, Dazzy's collaborating with me on a project. Liv and I had virtual coffee. I sent her a gift. When I went to New York, I saw another one of the fellows. I'm going to the movies this Saturday with another one of the fellows here um, in LA. So I guess that's it. I didn't know what to expect except from the professional side, but it's ended up being, um, you know, um, the gift that keeps on giving, the flowers that keep, keep on flowering, blossoming, whatever. Excuse my corny poetic vein. Um, and I'm currently um, an intern at Grey Wolf Press, which is one of the most amazing, I'm sorry, one of the most amazing indie presses here. Uh, and definitely, I definitely mentioned meeting Kate, Katie Dublinski, who is their production uh, extraordinaire here in the workshop. And I'll tell you, having been through the workshop has been very useful because there are a lot of things that I don't have to take a long time figuring out because I've heard about it in the workshop. So um, yeah, I guess that's it. Sorry, I spoke too much, Livia, you go. Hi, everyone. I don't know if I can tell so many good things as my colleagues here, but I will try. I mean, I came to the workshop with a different experience because I, I was working as an editor back in Brazil, like for a long time. And, and I stopped it for a while to pursue a career in academia. And I was like, oh, I'm finishing my PhD. Maybe now I'm going back to publishing, but I was living in the US because my partner is here doing his PhD. And I was like, how can, I figure out a way to get into the publishing industry in the West, being, I mean, experienced, but came from Brazil, working basically with Portuguese, so many challenges. So I got to know about the workshop with a friend who is uh, doing her PhD here in Seattle at the University of Washington, which is a partner of the workshop. And I was like, oh, that's very interesting. Maybe I can get an overview of the possibilities or the challenge for me in this industry. And it was like that. It was really helpful to get to know the vocabulary and the, the practice of the industry, like all the positions you can get if you are interested in, in, in working with that, not, not only editorial, the one that I'm more familiar with, but also marketing, publicity, many roles that I'm not as I mean, I couldn't understand that well before. So it was really interesting to get to know and to learn from people with lots of experience in these areas. Also, I, I found that it was really interesting to get to know who am I in this field and who I want to become in this field. Because I came to the workshop with this idea that, oh, I, maybe I want to work in academia publishing because I always worked with non-fictional books, mostly with visual culture, my area of expertise. And I was like, oh, maybe I would like to take a chance in academia facilities here in the West. You, you guys know how to do this. But I, I got to know that it's not for me. And it, it was really interesting to change my mind during the workshop. I was listening to lots of folks uh, coming from many prestigious academic publishers, publishings, and they, they were very different from me. They were like more scientists than me, you know? They're, they're not as art people as I am. And I resonated so much better with people working for art magazines or museums. And it was the same thing that I was doing back in Brazil, you know, where I worked for museums, I worked for art magazines, and I realized oh, I, I'm all right on my track, you know? <laughs> and it was really helpful to get to know this before the, the trial and error of trying to get a position in an academic publishing and realizing after two years, oh, it's not for me. So I, I totally recommend the workshop if, if you guys are like thinking about maybe that's my thing because you can change your mind. And it's really helpful to change your mind in advance. 
And another thing that I, I, I felt it was a, a huge takeaway from the workshop, it was this sense of community that's, uh, it's very, I mean, publishing is about community and it, it's really important to, to know your people and to make friends with them and to feel that you belong to, to a place and you have your folks for, for, I mean, you're aligned to work in a goal together with other folks. And, and, and I got that from, from ARB and I feel that I belong to, to this community and I make lots of friends. And I mean, that, that's probably the, the most important thing uh, to, to me because I mean, these friends, I'm, I'm, I will probably work with them in a way or another, as Natalia was saying. And if, even though it's not about work, I mean, life is not about work all the time. And, and I feel that's a, a valuable, a, a very resource for us to get friends. <laughs> Great. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and I, I agree, you know, the, really the wonderful thing about the program is the fellows and getting to know them and they come from all over the world and bring this wealth of different experiences to um, uh, to the workshop. We try to do some um, uh, alumni get togethers um, online and people have organized their own little reunions um, around the world because we have people in Berlin and New York and uh, Los Angeles and many different other places, Seattle. Um, so now I think we'd like to open up to questions. Um, so if you have a question uh, for us, um, please go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, or if you'd like, you can also um, raise your hand and we'd be happy to call on you. Carolyn has her hand up. Um, yes, it, how would I sort of submit any experience as a copy um, editor? I mean, <laughs> sort of in it, like how do you put a portfolio for copy editing? That seems kind of odd. I would just probably write about that experience in your cover letter would be good, but you can submit, you if you have an article that you've worked on the copy editing, you can submit the, the article. We'd be happy to look at it. So if you want to maybe <clears throat> we can submit like a redlined document or something like that, if you have that as an example for them so that we could see what kinds of edits you made, for example. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We also have some questions in the chat. The first one is there is there a payment plan or is it full payment only? Um, we do require payment before the program begins. Um, but it is we can split it up between I think we we have like a 50% deposit up front and then um and then the second part. So it's split up over two months. Okay. And the next one is, what's the acceptance rate for the program? Well, difficult to say um, because it, I think, has varied um, year to year. I'll say that we've um, it's usually a pretty self-selecting group of applicants. Um, and so um, we find that the, the quality of our applications is, is really high. And also, what specific fields, art, legal, editing, admin, within the publishing industry are the most or least competitive? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't know, but Irene, my, my impression is that editorial is usually the most competitive field to get into. Um, people who are starting out, especially if you have a lot of social media experience or other business experience, that can be a good way to kind of get your foot in the door. Um, I know we have a um, somebody who works in HR at Macmillan who comes to speak about their application process and different kinds of jobs that are available. And she has said that um, that often for internships, um, the editorial are extremely competitive. Um, some people um, start out in things like publicity or marketing. What do you think, Irene? Yeah, I think, I mean, part of it too, I, I would imagine is that editorial tends to be an area that most people are familiar with and associate with the job in the publishing industry. And I think that's also kind of the fun thing about the workshop is meeting people who are working in very, you know, um, very different parts of publishing that um, we're often not as familiar with. And so I would imagine that editorial is maybe the most impacted in part because of that, just the fact that, that that's the most readily available association <laughs> with publishing. Um, but, um, but yeah. And then does everyone in the program go in to work in publishing? 
No, I think some people um, are still in the, the PhD program and they may choose to go on in academia. Um, I think that's pretty common and, and they use the knowledge that they've gained from the publishing workshop, maybe to pursue their own um, writing career or to work on a, a magazine through their university or do some kind of publishing. So I think there's a wide variety of different careers that people choose. And then uh, somebody wanted to know if any of the alumni had attended the workshop online. And if not, then she'd love to hear somebody talk about what the experience was like. The, the workshop is completely online. So everybody attended online. You guys want to talk about what it was like being online? Um, I think I can say um, something about that. As I was saying in my introduction, it was really about, you know, buy yourself a heating pad to put on your lower back, have some stretch exercises you like, make sure you have water next to you and food breaks because it is really, truly intense. Um, have some physical books to read like on the off time because you're not going to be able to put in any more screen time. Um, I don't know if the question was also about that. Since there were literally people spread across the globe, people are working on different timelines. So sometimes you would send a message and only get an answer 12 hours later. And that's okay. <laughs> like, so I think because uh, the other thing I would say is if you get a chance, submit to PubLab to publish because I publish a piece and uh, a nonfiction piece and uh, I had never done that uh, here in the US. And it was interesting to go through the editorial process and the different stages, you know, because there's the person who edits it, the person who shows you how it looks on the website, the person who puts on the picture, the, there are so many people. And sometimes you're gonna have to have some words with some of these people. So it's good to have this, you know, less like lower stakes experience in this context, you know, because um, then I now know what to expect, what the stages are. I was in the process of publishing my uh, translation chapbook and like some, um, like the schedule was a little behind. So I, I better understood, you know, having learned things on the workshop. So I personally, I'm a big fan of online things. So so I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, let's leave it as you give their impression. I would like to, to say a word about the difference between the mag magazine track and the book track, because maybe some folks are wondering if they're going to choose one or another. I think the magazine track is amazing. And if you are willing to become a developmental editor, you should choose the magazine track because there's the place for you to learn how to edit. I mean, books are not teaching you this as good as magazines in general. I, I truly believe in that. But you should have the time to commit to the assignments. I mean, you, you have to commit to the workshop hours and have more time to do the assignments on your own. And you should be aware of this. And it's going to be a fast speed but it's worthwhile. Uh, I, I did the book track and I'm glad I did so just because I like working independently more. So if that's more your focus or if you want to work and collaborate more, then I would suggest the magazine track. As for online, I, I graduated before the pandemic. So this was my first really intensive online schedule and class. And it, it is incredibly intensive. Um, eating will be a problem. <laughs> so uh, food prep if you can. Uh, but even so, I, I actually enjoyed it more. I'm local, so I live in LA. Um, LARB is like 45 minute drive from me. <laughs> and avoiding traffic and not paying for gas and waking up early was really fantastic. Um, also, there's LitLit, Lit, which um, people that are here or local to LA, we, I was able to meet some of my cohort and my fellow peers in person. So there's always that second option that's available to you if you want to meet face-to-face. -face. Great, thank you guys. Um, so we had another question that's about um, the time that you would need to devote to the workshop. So people who work um, are currently working um, so as I said, the lectures are recorded, so you can watch those if you need to on your own schedule. 
Um, the one thing that is really needs to be um, in person would be those afternoon from 1.30 to 3, um, the magazine and book track. Some of those will be recorded um, because we'll hear from, we'll have like a, the um, editor-in-chief from LARV may come and, and do a presentation about the developmental editing. Um, you can watch that later, but there will be meetings in which you really need to be present with your team in order to um, work on art production or marketing or something like that. What other questions do we have, Myra? Um, somebody's asking about how many people in academia are going to be joining the workshop because they're doing their PhD dissertation in anthropology. So um, last year, I believe about 50% of our fellows were um, in a, a graduate program. Um, so PhD, MFA, and we have some master's um, students as well. So quite a few. And also, oh, sorry. Go ahead, my hair. I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Um, you can go ahead. Um, I just noticed there's also a question from Avish about whether this fellowship is meant to be only for those seeking a career in publishing and editing, or could authors wanting to be novelists, et cetera, benefit from them? And who's the ideal candidate if there is one? Um, so I, I guess I could <laughs> start by saying, like, ideally, yes, it, it is for people who are looking for a career in publishing. I mean, I think. Many of the people, as you've already heard from some of our alums um, here as well, like also do have an interest in writing and um, professional interest in writing as well. But in terms of the training and the conversations, it is more about developing a career in, in publishing. And so that would be, I think, the primary focus. But I would want to, I guess, turn it over to our, our alumni to ask like how, I guess, um, the experience of the workshop informed um, your own writing processes and projects. I think... A number of people in the workshop are um, like fiction writers or nonfiction writers, even some poets. Um, and I think the reality is, reality is for most people, it's not feasible to make a living as a writer from the get go. So a lot of writers end up working in publishing. So it's better to have, you know, some knowledge besides because we've heard from a number of speakers that it looks bad. Like if you're applying to an editorial internship and you say, well, my dream is to be a writer, but I need this job. So, um, so I think, um, no, it's true. So if, but I know from some friends who are writers that they say that learning from agents, hearing from um, other people who are clo closely working with writers, and participating in the professionalizing workshop, like how to write a query letter, how to write a cover letter, how to tweak your CV has helped them to be better writers, like out in the world to pitch people and, and such. Great, thank you. And then somebody's asking, if I'm requesting financial aid, will I need to submit my 2022 to 2023 FAFSA form or my 2023 to 2024 FAFSA form? And then there's a second question to that. Are also publishing documents created during student academic work valid for the portfolio submission? Okay. Um, well, so just submit your most recent um, FAFSA form or, um, or 1040. So whatever you have that is the most recent version um, that's applicable to your situation now. Um, and the second question was about are publishing documents created during student academic work valid for portfolio submission? Yes. Um, so lots of people have um, worked on a literary magazine at their university. That would be um, that would be fine to submit. Okay, let's see. Uh, other questions and looking through. I think there's a question about how many scholarships are on offer. So um, this works a little bit differently depending on whether you're um, applying um, as a student from one of our institutional partners where we have a set number of scholarships defined. Um, for example, I think at Berkeley we have you know four that you can apply for. At, um, as Natalia mentioned at UCI, we had two last year that you could apply for. And so um, that's a little bit different. Um, otherwise, for our kind of main fund, it's it's a fund. So we basically are, are kind of, you know, trying to fundraise every year, apply for grants every year to have a certain um, um, amount of money that we can set aside to be able to provide financial aid for students on a need-based 
on, on a need basis, <laughs> which is why we ask for like the statement of financial need and for the, you know, um, um, other, other documents just to kind of get a sense of um, how great the need is. And obviously, we, you know, we would love to be able to meet everybody's need 100%, but just given our own limitations as a small um, nonprofit, <laughs> um, you know, that's, um, we, we do what we can on that front. Um, I will say that in previous years, um, just given also just the, um, the where our, a lot of our students are coming from, um, the majority of our students do receive some form of financial aid to attend. And so we, we do try and, um, and help everyone out as much as possible um, if there is financial need there. And if you are a PhD student um, uh, at a um, university that is not one of our partners, um, current partners, um, sometimes we found that people can go and ask for support from their departments, and we're really happy to help you um, try to negotiate that um, as well. So lots of people have found that they were able to access um, summer funding. Um, you can find our university partners on our website. If you have any questions about whether um, you are eligible for one of those, um, feel free to reach out to me. And we have somebody with their hand up. Sorry, oh. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Go ahead. So much for this session. I was wondering if you're interested in both book publishing and also magazine, can we are we allowed to have access to the other videos for the other track? Yes, absolutely. Um, you can view any of the videos um, for the magazine and, and book track. And I think there's also a related question as to whether you um, mentioned that on the um, we choose a track on the application and there is a space to do that. And then once you're actually admitted, you can let us know if you change your mind. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so it's not like written in stone, but it is just kind of helpful for us to get a sense of as we're doing our admissions process, how many students are interested in one track versus the other. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we had a, another question related to the portfolios. Is it, it's, she said, it's, it's, they say it's been about four years since they've graduated from college and my last work was at that time. Would I still be able to use that work in my submission? So yes, I think fun. so. I think that would be fine. Um, you know, if it was 20 years ago, um, maybe it's no longer quite as, as relevant, but I think that's pretty recent. And then there's also a question about, do you try to put together a diverse group across different ethnicities, countries, and backgrounds, et cetera? Is it more competitive if we've seen similar to, the, to some other applicants? Well, I think it's a really important part of our mission. Um, that we do want the workshop to be representative of um, the people who we think should be in publishing, which is everyone. Um, so, um, so yes, we do try to um, emphasize diversity across um, all different categories um, in the workshop, both in our fellows and also um, in our speakers. Yeah, but we aren't, um, in terms of weighing the applications, we're not weighing them against each other in that regard. <laughs> um, so I think just as kind of an overall principle in terms of how we, we you know, um, um, yeah, prioritize applications. We are excited to, to see that, but. Desi, did you want to say something? Yes, um, someone talked about, um, I think someone mentioned something about diversity. And I just wanted to chime in and say that if you're worried that you're going to be with a bunch of writers and like PhD students, I think um, there was a couple people that all their experience was being a bookseller at Barnes and Noble and they got accepted into the program and I'm friends with them now. So <laughs> it's, there's a whole variety of different backgrounds that are in the program. I'm getting the cowboy stare down. I want to eat from Cali. <laughs> okay, I think you have your. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. That's okay. Um, yes, yeah. I would say the one thing that all of our fellows have in common is that they're all really passionate about um, literature and, and publishing. Um, how do we put together the portfolio? Yes, you can scan pages um, for not, don't give us every magazine issue you've worked on. You could just give us a, a representative sample. Um, that would be fine. Um, I think you can also probably put in a link to a site if it's an online site. Um, I mean, do you have a couple of questions about institutional partnerships? I believe we have a list on our website of our current institutional partners. Um, and um, it, and it tends, sometimes it's specific to specific departments or divisions or grad students versus undergrads. And so I'm, I'm not sure if we specify that, but I think we can probably 
add that to um, our website or you can always get in touch if you have a question about your particular institution. Um, there's also a question about whether or not we apply through them or through us. And um, I think with all of our partners, actually, we have it arranged so that you just apply through us. And so there's actually a space on the application form to articulate like, you know, your institutional affiliation um, and that helps us sort. <laughs> Sort that out so we can figure out which um, which scholarships you're eligible for. Um, if you are applying for a scholarship through your institution, um, um, we do ask that you also provide that scholarship information as well. So your statement of financial need um, and the doc the kind of associated documents too, so we can make sure that we're taking that into consideration as well for the scholarship consideration. Um, there's also a question, I guess, about, um, oh, uh, if um, someone wanted to um, start an independent press, will this workshop help? Um, with the business side of such a startup? And I think yes is the answer, but I'll let Lindsay go into more detail on that. Oh, yes, absolutely. And we've we've seen some of our um some of our fellows have gone on to found um, literary companies, um, magazines. We're really excited to see those kinds of projects. So um absolutely you'll learn a lot about the business side. Um, and the pros and cons of being a nonprofit versus a profit um, organization, um, and lots of information. It's also a really good opportunity to do that kind of networking if you are looking for someone who can mentor you through the process of establishing your own press or magazine. We also have a question. Are there re-applicants? Is this offered every year at this time? And do you see this continuing to be fully online in future years? Well, um, yes, um, they, we do have some people who um, have, for some one reason or another, were accepted and then decided that they couldn't attend and they've reapplied. So that that has happened. Um, it, it is going to happen every year. Um, we're very committed to the program. Uh, whether it will ever return in person is a question that we wrestle with um, every day. Um, right now, we are an online program. And there's another question of how much time outside of class is required for the program. Hmm. I'm going to ask the alumni to speak to that. See, I think, um, Livia, you were in the magazine track. Um, did you spend time outside of the um, workshop working on the magazine? Yes, I, I spent a lot of time. I mean, but for me, it was a double challenge because English is not my native language. So everything I was like double checking that is if my comments were accurate and everything. So you, you have to take that into consideration. But I, I did some meetings with the author I was editing over the weekends. And it was a lot of, lot of fun, but I mean, I was very committed to the thing. And I don't know if everyone was doing like that, but that was my experience. Yeah, I think if you're worried about the time commitment outside of the workshop, I would probably suggest that you choose the book track, which is less intensive because you are not producing a magazine. So there's less pressure um, to work on it um, outside. Um, and we have had, you said, someone said some work full time and it's also a parent. We have had lots of parents um, in the program we see their kids who are very cute <laughs> join us on zoom yeah i was going to say one of um my friends had a 10-month baby with them during the workshop um and it, they made it work for them and i was going to say the same thing uh as somebody who was publishing on pub lab i didn't have like uh video meetings with my editor we're talking through google docs so you can not adapt and you know talk to the person who's editing your work see what works for you I will say the turnaround for the edits in the article was very quick, like two or three days. Um, so it might be that on one week, you need to make time to make these edits if you're publishing, you know? So book track if you don't have a lot of time and if you're publishing something, make, you know, make room for two or three hours on during one or two weeks, I'll say that. I think we have time for one other question, which I think is really important. It's for um, how US specific is the publishing workshop? Um, if you're interested in working in publishing abroad, is it still helpful? Um, so I'm going to ask um, Livia to answer this because we do have, we are really happy to welcome people from around the world. I think it's really helpful, even though you're not working in the US. For example, I'm not working right now in the US. I'm still collaborating with uh, publishing houses back in Brazil. 
And I felt like the workshop was great for me to organize in my mind which are my, my great strengths, you know, the things that I, I feel that I have confidence, that I'm good at. And it was really helpful to do that because I, I got a, a broader perspective of the publishing industry and how I was thinking about the issues in a daily basis. Like I was very aware of the, the problems and I was doing my best to, to solve them. So I felt like, oh, I, I'm in the right track. And this kind of confidence, it's really hard to find in this, in this area because it's a very isolated, I mean, I, I'm talking from the experience of the editorial positions. You're working on your own and sometimes you don't have good mentors that are going to provide you feedback on your work. So you are developing by your own sometimes. And sometimes you spend a lot of time being an assistant. It was my case. I was like many years working as assistant editor back in Brazil. And I was like, oh no, maybe now it's time to, to put myself in the mindset of an editor. And Larby really helped me. I know it's corny to talk about mindset and stuff and everyone is already done with this bullshit, very entrepreneur uh, discourse, but in a way it was helpful because I <laughs> coach us. Yes, uh, in a way it was helpful because I was uh, selling myself uh, sh short, you know, I was like, oh, the only thing I know for sure is proofreading. And, and after the workshop, I realized that actually I'm better in developmental editing than in proofreading. I am a terrible proofreader in comparison of how good I am in the, the first stage of the, 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 the stuff, you know? And it's really nice to know these without judging, like, oh, is it a fancy position? Uh, because I mean, sometimes people are drawn to publishing because of the vanity of it. And it's not the best way to, to do because, I mean, publishing is a hard work. It's challenge. It's as challenged as academia, I can tell. And, and you should be in this situation if you really like to do the job, if you like the daily basis, the boredom of facing uh, the, the word and, and the, the, the revision track of the word and all the little things, you know, we should really enjoy this. So I, I would recommend the workshop for everyone because I think it, it's very good for giving you insights about your own possibilities. Can I just let's add something quickly, Lindsay? Sure, go ahead. I think what I learned in the workshop is that there are some jobs I had no idea existed. So for example, you can be a scout for potential translations. Like somebody was in Germany, I think, and they had mentioned that they read books ahead of time from the US to pitch it to German publishing houses. So there are some jobs that are like bridges between US publishing and other countries. So, and I had no idea, for example, like I could have somehow have imagined this, but I think we learned that as well in the workshop. Uh, on, on the same way, like people who pitch like books from other countries to be movies in the US, you know, the, there are so many possibilities we learn about in the workshop. Thank you. I think we're almost out of time, but Desi, did you want to add? Oh, yeah, as far as um, like the US centric publishing world, um, I know all of us, the alumni and as well as LARB is really interested in translated uh, works. And how um, those works come is well represented in the publishing workshop, as well as like international rights and how works get submitted through to be translated. Um, just a shout out to like transit books <laughs> and uh, Melville House working on those. And that 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 is well represented if that's something you're interested in. Thank you so much, Desi. Well, thank you all for joining us um, this morning for this um, info session. Um, and thank you to our alumni, to Desi, Natalia, and Livia for coming back to, to talk about their experience. We really appreciate you. Um, if you have any questions, if we didn't get to your question in the um, in our in the chat, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm happy to answer any emails. You can reach me at publishingworkshop at lareviewofbooks.org. Um, the information's on our website. Um, and we really look forward to reading your applications and seeing some of you in the workshop this summer. Thanks, everybody.